Hello everybody at home. Vinman's Bakery is here once again. Let me show you. I'm so glad you're watching this. This is a, uh, a uh, variety platter from Vinman's Bakery brought to you by Vinman's Bakery in downtown Ellensburg, Washington delivered here by Jeff Clindworth, the owner. So Jeff is with us. He doesn't want to be on camera, but I'm going to swing you around. Let's see. Oh, yes, please. Applause. <laughs> Applause. So as you look around here, I can kind of give you home viewers a sense of uh, who we have and people continue to roll in here. It's about 11 o'clock in the morning here in Vantage, Washington. And we are about to have a little geology lesson here on the spot. And I'm continuing to roll you around. I'm smelling the Vinmans. That's that's a nice. <laughs> and the star of our show is this erratic right here. We've all hiked about 30 minutes or so out to this beautiful erratic, and uh, we have little uh, flocks, right, Bernadette? Flocks that have uh, our perp. Thank you, ma'am. So we've got uh, people of all backgrounds, all interests, and uh, Jeff mentioned that uh, this Danish uh, terrain uh, should be uh, available, especially to people who came the furthest or farthest, whatever the right word is. So we have VJ from Shreveport, Louisiana, who happened to be in the area and uh, saw the pop-up announcement. He's like, oh, I can fold this in. This is fine. We have Dennis from San Jose, California, same thing, happened to be in the area, wanting to see these sites and then saw the pop-up. So especially those two guys. And other other town, Portland, Oregon, give us some more here. Sydney. Sydney. <laughs> Nobody from Ireland? What, this is a disappointment, come on. Just kidding. Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon Washington. Tacoma, Washington, North Bend, Washington, Salem, Oregon, Rob Marysville. is here again. Marysville, Renton, Muckleteal, you bet. Ellensburg, I'll say it, Ellensburg, yes. Granger, Washington. <laughs> okay, good. All right, well, wonderful. Well, yes, this is an experiment to record this as opposed to live stream, but I don't want to get too uh, carried away with that. I just want to go ahead and get right to it here. So thank you at home for joining us. And of course, thank you all for making the journey out here and especially driving so far. So now the pressure's on me. I gotta do something real. I gotta make this worth your time. Um, let me remind you of the approach and then uh, we'll do about, I don't know, 30 minutes, 45 maybe if I'm really rolling. And then um, we'll do some question and answer. And I'll make sure to repeat your question for the recording before I answer and then, and then we'll be done and we'll leave no trace of, of our time out here together. Um, the other pop-up events that I have done to this point have focused on the fact that we are structured. We do observations first, simple observations, place names, maybe some elevations. Just try to be a good science person and just describe, just collect data, information. That always is the first step. Then we can go to some ideas that fit the data. And we need to make sure that our ideas are based on all of the observations that are out here. And we're not the first to make some observations. This is 100 years worth of observations here out in this country. And yes, this is the 100th anniversary of J. Harlan Bretz being out here. Right here, right across the way, Frenchman Cooley on foot, Potholes Cooley on foot, Drumheller Channels on foot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I will do a little bit of J. Holland Bretz with you as well with a couple of sources. But I don't want to go on forever because I want to involve your questions and the fact that you are all out here with us. I assume you're comfortable. I assume you can hear us. So let's go ahead and make this work. The other preamble is saying that I, I, I want to be verbal and that's it. There's no chalkboard. There's no handouts. There's no maps. There's no me drawing anything. And that's on purpose. I want to make this happen almost like a radio episode, you know, like can I, can I create something in your mind that you don't have based on this setting? Last preamble. You can talk all you want about the Ice Age floods in a classroom or the Ice Age floods on a video program on YouTube or on television, but 
I don't think it totally sinks in until you're actually out here like we are this morning. I think just that scale is what's missing. You can have the best animation, you can have the best visual, you can have the best cartoon, you can have the best stats, but I think you need this. I think you need to be able to use this expanse. And that's our hope today without stepping in the vendors. I don't know, can we just, I don't know how we want to do that. Pass that around maybe, I don't know. Okay, so the idea is we're going to use this. So let's get to it. The local bedrock is basalt. We know this from many of our past episodes. Basalt bedrock. You saw that walking up here, our 30 minute walk. You saw across Rocky Cooley, and I'll swing the viewers over that way right now. We can see past this beautiful white boulder that the local bedrock are basalt lava layers. I'm sure most of you noticed this. It's part of the German chocolate cake. The number is 16 million years ago. 16 million years ago. 16 million years ago, you're looking south right now across the way. In the haze, we're looking south, kind of to the southeast. That ridge on the skyline in the haze is the Saddle Mountains. Made out of what? German chocolate cake, 16 million year old basalt lava. There's a big hole in the Saddle Mountains where the Columbia River has flowed through the Saddle Mountains for millions of years, that's known as Sentinel Gap. And you can drive through Sentinel Gap on a state route. And on the other side of that gap is a little town called Mattawa. You keep going south, you eventually hit down to the Pasco Basin and the Tri-Cities. Vantage is the nearest town to us. We cannot really see Vantage. And from our vantage point right here, oh. <laughs> Can't see vantage from our vantage point. Wow, love it. Right down over the cliff, right down over this flat is Vantage Washington and Interstate 90 crossing. So many of you will, it's all downhill from here, right? Walking back to the car, it's all downhill, a couple hundred feet of elevation, and you'll see I-90 crossing uh, the uh, Lake Wanapum, uh, otherwise known as uh, the Columbia River once upon a time. All right, swinging to the north just for the home viewers. And again, you're welcome to get up, walk around, crane your neck, whatever you like. I don't know if there's a huge landmark to the north, but again, we can see just visually that it's basalt. It's basalt as far as the eye can see. Let me add a little bit mentally about the extent of the basalt field from this location. To the west, we have basalt, German chocolate cake, until we get to Kalielum, Washington. That's the end of the line. We go northwest, German chocolate cake, Columbia River basalt lava, 16 million year old basalt until we get to Lion Rock. That's the end of the line. Wenatchee, Washington to the north of us. That's the end of the line for the Columbia River basalt lavas. Spokane, Washington to the east. And this way, we go all the way into Oregon. In some cases, down almost to Nevada. So yes, this is a regional story. And there's a reason to hammer that point with you. Because what do we have? We have a boulder, 10 feet across, that's not basalt. And if we firmly understand that there's basalt for tens of miles in all directions, we have some explaining to do. Why is this boulder here? And is it the only one? Those that want to take the time after we kind of break our session, or if you want to get up and look right now, don't be bashful. There are dozens of granite rocks here. It's not just this single boulder. It's dozens of them, just right here. And if we took the time, I don't think we are going to, but if we took the time to just start walking up to that ridge, up to that ridge, up to the ridge behind you, we would find dozens, hundreds more of these erratics. So if you're new to the concept, an erratic is a misplaced boulder. It's a boulder that's not where it should be. Meaning we have bedrock that's not basalt, 
and yet here's this thing sitting here. What's the story? Well, a hundred years ago, it wasn't clear what the story was. And there was potential thought about a glacier coming from Canada and getting down this far south. In fact, some of those early maps literally had an ice sheet coming across the Canadian border and coming down here into central Washington to explain these glacial erratics. And that is the case in other places in North America, of course. You find an erratic like this in Wisconsin, or in upstate New York, or in Quebec, or in Montana, or in British Columbia, and the ice was there. So, now we're getting a little bit more sophisticated. Is this an ice story? Yes and no. My God, there's the ridge. Can, should we imagine this big ice sheet a mile thick, two miles thick, coming over this ridge and dropping this erratic? The answer is no. So it is a glacial erratic. In other words, it's an erratic from the Ice Age time. But we are now sure this is not an erratic that was dropped by an ice sheet. Now, I need to share some evidence with you to convince you that that's the story, that this is an Ice Age flood story and not an Ice Age sheet story. So especially from our viewers at home, you're familiar with the concept of an erratic, and most of you, even if you're West Siders, even if you're Seattle, Olympia, Mount Vernon, Darrington, whatever, those erratics on the West Side are directly the result of the Puget Ice Sheet. This is different. We do not have evidence of an ice sheet right here. And yet, we have these boulders that were somehow brought in here during the Ice Age. You see the distinction between those two concepts. Okay. Um, so I need to share more data with you then. He goes to his back pocket. And I've got a passage describing the summer of 1922 with Brett's. Don't let me forget about that. That's going back in the back pocket. But the notes I took last night at the kitchen table is from a master's thesis done by a Central Washington University grad student by the name of Ryan Carlson. Carlson with a K. Uh, published in two, 2006, but it feels like it was longer ago. Hey, Brian, uh, Ryan, if you watch this, it feels like you were around longer ago than that, but whatever. I thought that's the date you had on your thesis. Okay, just had a thought. So you're watching this replay. Uh, in the link below, I'm going to have a link to Ryan's thesis. You'll be able to see this thesis. It's a good thesis. I got a lot of specific information from this area from Ryan Carlson's thesis on these erratics in the Vantage area. And you can see the quality of work done by a person at Central Washington University, <laughs> supervised by my buddy Carl Loquist, who teaches in the geography department. And Ryan Carlson still is a part of this scene. He works for Washington State Parks, and this is State Parks land right here. Okay. Ryan, whatever summer that was, maybe it was more than one summer, was here on foot, kind of doing his best J. Harlan Brett's impersonation. And his goal was to cover all that you see and more, maybe a few square miles, I kind of forget. And he made a map. He found every erratic out here. He plotted it on his map. He noted the kind of rock. He noted the elevations of the rocks. And he gave some very specific detail from this small area that is now interpreted when you visit this Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park. Notice we're in Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park. We're not talking about petrified wood today. We did a pop-up last fall right over there at the museum, and we were talking mostly about those petrified logs. That is not the topic today. The topic is the Ice Age and these boulders that were dropped here less than 20,000 years ago less than 20,000 years ago, not 16 million years ago. So we have to make a huge leap in the time scale. Let's get to it, boy. Get to it. Ryan Carlson. He has a photo of this very erratic in his thesis. That's what got me thinking about this spot. And yes, Tom Foster was the first guy to walk me out to this spot and uh, got me rolling in that direction. Our elevation right here is 1100. 
Warning, we got numbers coming, okay? <laughs> Our elevation right here is 1,100 feet above sea level. 1,100, 0, 0, 1,100 feet above sea level. You started your walk down at the cars at the trailhead, that's 900. So you gained 200 feet roughly in elevation. 900 feet at the cars, 1,100 feet elevation here with this big erratic. This is one of the bigger ones right here. Is this the biggest erratic on record? Of course not. Is there an erratic up by that guy getting close to the top of the ridge? I like there's a moving erratic right there, that guy with his pale shirt. All right, we got to keep mapping that guy. There are, Ryan found 337 erratics in the immediate area. 337 plotted them during that summer or two summers or whatever it was. Are they all at 1,100 feet like this one is? No. Ryan found his 337 erratics distributed in a range of elevations. The lowest erratic is down at 641. So a couple hundred feet below where you parked the cars, there are erratics at various, uh, various landscapes, below where you parked the cars. So he's found erratics, more than 300 erratics, littered across this green landscape, probably wasn't green in August when he was maybe here, from 641 elevation to two, 1,263, I stumbled, let me say it again. The highest elevation that he found erratics, 1,263 foot elevation. More than 100 feet higher than us. Okay, let's pause. Is this an ice sheet story? No. So what is this a story? It's a story of Ice Age flood water, sometimes known as the Missoula floods. You did your hike this morning underwater. And the water, depending on which flood we're talking about, was at least 100 feet deeper than where you're sitting. The magic number out here, which is the high water mark of the biggest flood to inundate this particular area, yeah, it is 1,263 feet. Now that's a little bit higher than the highest water mark of something called Lake Lewis. So some of you are familiar with this concept, that many of the Ice Age floods that came over eastern Washington ponded on the other side of Sentinel Gap there, quite a bit further, in this place called Pasco Basin, this big broad open area and Wallula Gap is just downstream from that. And that Lake Lewis is the standing water during the Ice Age floods. In other words, after the water is out of here, it goes through Sentinel Gap, it gets into the Pasco Basin, it forms Lake Lewis and the high water, in other words, the bathtub is up to an elevation of 1250, that's a magic number, 1250, if you're in the lower Yakima Valley. And I talked to somebody from Sunnyside or Yakima or Moxie or whatever, they say, well, was, was my place under Lake Lewis? This ice? I said, what's your elevation? It's like, I don't know, I gotta look it up. <laughs> and then they come back and they go, yeah, well, we're higher than 1250. And I'm like, well, there we go. Your place was not underwater because 1,250 feet elevation is the max height of the bathtub downstream of here in Lake Lewis. But here it's a little bit higher. And if we go up to Wenatchee, which is, you know, half an hour drive upriver from here, the high water mark gets higher and higher for a number of reasons, maybe not our focal point right here. 1263. A few more facts and figures, and then we'll get to the core of our discussion. Not only was Ryan Carlson, with a K, able to find these erratics uh, between basically river level and up to 1263, he found them three and a half miles away from the Columbia. So it's not like these erratics are just hugging the shore. Depending on if there's a broad side canyon like this, you can have erratics going up more than three miles as the crow flies west of the Columbia itself. 
So there is a kind of a geographic pattern to this as well. I mentioned that there's dozens of granite rocks here, not just this single one. Those are known as berg mounds or high density clusters of these erratics. So we're adding more information now. We're not just finding these lonely big ones, but oftentimes you can find natural clusters of these foreign rocks, of these erratics, of these rocks that don't match. You're like, what is the story? Why are you screwing around? You know what we do now, right? We have to really be disciplined with this. We can't fall in love with one idea, and this is back in Brett's time. But you eventually mount enough data along the lines of what Ryan Carlson was doing. Elevations, densities, numbers of rocks. Are all the erratics granite? In general, this is from Bruce, Bruce Bjornstad's book, uh, generally the erratics here in south central Washington, about 75% are granite. And that means a quarter of these erratics in Washington are not granite, but they are metamorphic rocks and other kinds of uh, bedrock lithologies that match out of state more than they do our state. Elevation of the former Columbia River Valley floor before the dams were constructed, 480 feet. So more than 100 feet we want to visualize being the true floor of the valley. Why is that important? Well, we're finally to the interpretation part. This is an Ice Age flood story. And we do have Ice Age floods, water, coming down this Columbia Valley. And so if we have a valley floor that's at 480 feet, and we have a high water mark here at 1263, we have 800, 900 feet of water coming into this area multiple times. Did the Ice Age flood water coming into this area down the Columbia follow the same path every time? Absolutely not. Oh, you're saying there's more than one flood then? Yes, I am. We don't have time for that today, but there's overwhelming field evidence that there were multiple floods. You're like, how many? Still working on it. But multiple floods of varying volumes, for sure, that's what we want. Some of the Ice Age floods came right down the Columbia River, over Wenatchee, over Vantage, right through Sentinel Gap as you're looking but not all of them followed that route. Because sometimes we had an ice sheet blocking the Columbia River Valley, up by Chelan, up by Bridgeport. And so the water was sent down the Grand Coulee and over Dry Falls, went into the Quincy Basin, and then that water spilled into this Columbia River Valley not far away from here. So if we visualize a flood and we realize a batch of erratics brought in. We still haven't gotten to how. It's not the same path every time. That's the point. It's not the same path every time. Sometimes the water came over land, came down Moses Cooley. Sometimes the water came a different flood, came down Grand Cooley, Quincy Basin came over Frenchman Cooley, got in here. Sometimes the flood didn't bother with Grand Cooley and just got into the Columbia River Valley way up by Grand Coulee Dam country and followed the Columbia all the way down here. But the water doesn't care. It's here. And the water is not crystal clear. <laughs> An undersold part of this, if you ask me and a few other geologists, what's your visualization of the water? It's not clear water. I mean, it's the Ice Age, it's cold, okay, it'd be kind of cool if it was this beautiful, like, Ice Age pristine, like, aquamarine color or something. Uh-uh. Because depending if the flood is coming over land or following the Columbia, there's varying amounts of sediment that the water is picking up. Picking up and carrying. Forget about the boulders, just the, just the sediment load in this water is a thing. And so again, I mentioned Tom Foster, who was very into this Ice Age floods for a few years. And he kept saying, why don't we talk about the color of the water? It should be chocolate milk. It should be chocolate brown. It's got all the suspended silt in it. If you make an animation of water coming over dry falls, it needs to be look like chocolate milk. It's not clear water. 
And then just last summer, I was out with a geologist who was looking carefully at some of the deposits by Soap Lake and Afreda, and he's like, my God, these Ice Age flood deposits in the lower part of the Grand Coulee look like almost like lahars to me. They almost look like mud flows. Like, and of course, in my cutesy way, I'm like, well, okay, so maybe it wasn't chocolate milk. Maybe it was like a chocolate milk shake. Maybe it had a thick consistency. And you're like, are you off on a tangent? I don't think I am because now we have maybe a flood that has some viscosity to it. And that's the transport agent for these boulders, big and small? Okay, most of you know what the conventional story is, and I'm about to share it with you. It involves an iceberg. What did I say, 30 minutes? Oh, I'm at 30-minute mark. Okay, I, 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 I can do this. Just a few more minutes. The conventional answer for these erratics if we're in Ice Age flood country, whether you want it to be clear water, I don't think anybody does if they really think about it, whether you want it to be chocolate milk and still be mostly, you know, watery, okay, I think that's the most popular visualization. But even if you want it to be a little bit more thick, like a thick chocolate milkshake, you're bringing these erratics in on a flood and they're not being dropped at 480 feet. What am I pointing to? I'm pointing to the floor of the Columbia River Valley over there. And we have an Ice Age flood coming down there. Why aren't all the boulders brought in by a flood dropped at the bottom? That would be the most obvious thing. Look at the size of this thing. What kind of weight are we talking about? How is it possible that we have erratics that are dropped anywhere except for the very floor of a river valley? Or in other words, the main pathway of the flood. I keep pointing over there because if we can visualize a flood coming down the Columbia, you can all look right over there right now if you want, and that, that flood is heading right for Sentinel Gap. You know how floods work. The fastest water flow is right in the center of the channel, right? And over here, if the flood is big enough, we're going to get wet. But we're not going to have the highest velocity flood water over here, right? It's going to stay in the middle of the channel. We've seen just a river flood, video of it on, you know, the nightly news or whatever. And you can picture these little logs that were floating in the flood and, and they get kind of hung up in the side, right? Maybe there's a little eddy or something and, and it just kind of circles and spins out there in the side channel. Well, that's what we are. We're in one of these side channels. So if we get serious about making an animation for this area right in here, there's all sorts of data to suggest that we have an eddy, a big circular quiet water area, a pool if you want to think of it that way, while the main channel is still going through. Plain boy? Boy, this is like almost every time we're out here now. Okay, let's get this guy on camera. Fans of geology, they want to be part of the show. Damn, I was cooking there. I had, we had an eddy. We had, we, had this, we had this chocolate shake swirling through here, and I'm finally to the main visual, and that is an iceberg. So if it has not dawned on you, our visual for depositing the hundreds of erratics at high elevations, more than two, three miles away from the main channel of the flood, is to have icebergs rafting or floating these rocks in here. And you're like, I can't, no, I can't, but I can't sign off on that. I was with you every step of the way, but I just can't, that seems too crazy. Iceberg, like Yukon Cornelius, like iceberg, like a floating block of ice? That's hard enough to visualize. And then you're telling me that this thing is sitting on top of, like a garnish, like a cherry, or in it? And yeah, that's what we're saying. And the data is overwhelming. The clusters exist. The interpretation of the clusters is there was one iceberg here that had width and depth. And there was more than one erratic in that block of ice. 
there was a whole bunch of rock in that ice. And that iceberg got floated in on top of the flood water. Like we were saying, it wants to get to a quiet place, so the iceberg is going to just find its way over here in the side canyon out of the main, you know, a bunch of those icebergs are just cruising past us, by the way. If you're an iceberg that's right in the middle of a flood path, you're heading straight to Sentinel Gap, you're shooting right through, you keep rolling, baby. You don't stop till you get to the Pasco Basin. And Wallula Gap holds you up in Lake Lewis. But here, we have a bit of a constriction. Sentinel Gap is a constriction. We maybe have some hydraulic ponding just because that water is all trying to wait to get through that gap. And yeah, maybe the gap was a little narrower at the dawn of the Ice Age than it is now. But still, we have good evidence that many of these erratics in these side canyons are the result of these icebergs getting out of the main pathway and getting into some slower water. Now, here's where I get a little shaky. But I've gotten some notes from various sources to maybe help visualize this. How big does the iceberg have to be for a particular erratic? I think that's a common question. If you're curious about this concept, like, okay, so the iceberg isn't exactly the same size as this. It has to be bigger. Is there a general rule of thumb? Is there some math you can apply to this? There is some back of the envelope calculations that can be done and has been, has been done. We'll see if you like this. Take the size of the erratic, the iceberg was 20 times the size of the biggest erratic. Don't ask me for the math. A block of ice 20 times the size of the biggest erratic. And if there's a bunch of erratics of different sizes, they're all coming from that, that one iceberg. You're like, I don't even, why are we even talking about icebergs? I don't get it. Well, you may know that many of these Ice Age floods are floods, catastrophic floods, because there's a dam of ice somewhere upstream, whether it's in Idaho or, dare I say it, British Columbia, you hold a bunch of ice, ice, ice Age water behind that ice dam and finally you fail the dam, you bust up the dam into a bunch of pieces. What happened to the dam? The broken pieces of the ice dam that are being carried by the water that is released and by studying the basics of how glaciers work, glaciers carry rocks of different sizes away from mountainous areas, or at least upflow in the glacier itself. So to get rocks in ice is no big whoop. That's a worldwide phenomenon. To break up a glacier into pieces is not that big a deal either if you study places where Ice Age flooding has happened. Maybe a bigger challenge is to visualize how that iceberg can get itself into a place like this. And so be careful now if we say how old, let me, I'm sorry, let me, let me so 20 times the size of the erratic for the size of the iceberg, uh, some calculations about the weight of the iceberg, seven times the weight of the erratic. Like you need a, a block of ice that's at least seven times heavier than the I, I'm already uncomfortable. Don't, don't press me on that, okay? <laughs> Just reporting what I read. Um, so what I was going to say is let's be careful. If we say what's the age of this erratic, you can take that question different ways, right? What's the age of the basalt bedrock? That's 16 million. That's the age of the lava flows coming out of the cracks. We did that a couple weeks ago at Drumheller Channels. Okay, that's no big deal. But what's the, ice, what's the age of this erratic? You could view that two different ways, right? What's one way? Uh, chip, 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 chip. Take the rock, granite, feldspar, quartzes, biotite, send it to the lab, get an absolute age date like I was doing last winter with the crazy Eocene series and Mike Eddy has high precise dates on a granite. Remember some of that stuff? Some of you have seen some of those programs. Well, that's got nothing to do with the Ice Age, right? That's, that's when did this magma cool into granite? And we're saying that happened up in the North Cascades or up in the Okanagan of BC or it happened up in the Panhandle of Idaho, you know? 
And I don't know the answer. Nobody studied this to know the age of the granite itself. You're like, well, it can't be that hard. Well, it is that hard. Again, if you saw the series this winter, I'm angry all of a sudden, I don't know why. <laughs> Just going to the North Cascades, which is not the source of these granites because of the geometry we're talking about today and the geography we're talking about today, you remember there were three major magmatic flare-ups just in the North Cascades. I forget the numbers, but you know, 96 to 80, whatever. Eocene magmas. And I did a video a couple weeks ago up in Northrop Canyon, which is one prime time place in the upper Grand Coulee by Grand Coulee Dam. And some of that granite is 71.99 million years ago, according to Jeff Tepper. Well, my point is there's a lot of different generations of granite that looks about like this that's up in northern Washington, just northern Washington. So the age of the granite I don't think is that big a deal to us. But there is another date, a more germane date to our discussion today. What's the date of dropping the rock here? How long has the rock been like sitting here? That's way more important for our discussion today. I don't think we care about the age of the granite originally, but since we're mostly focusing on an Ice Age flood story, aren't we caring about exactly how many million years ago did a flood of water come in here? And is there any way to figure that out? There is what There are ways. There are ways. The newest technique, and it might take another decade or two to really make sure that this is an accurate way to go about it, is to truly sample the outer shell of an erratic. And you got to pick the right erratic. Now, this, this guy, I hope you come up and take a look at this friend afterwards. There's way too much lichen on this to use this surface exposure dating technique that I'm about to describe as quickly as possible. But Andrea Balbus, John Stone, a number of geologists here in the Pacific Northwest have been visiting some erratics that they're sure it has not been moved. It has a nice naked surface, not full of lichen, other things I don't know about. It's a granitic erratic. They break off the outer shell of that granite and they look at the quartz. And there is radioactive decay happening within that quartz with silicon and beryllium and I forget aluminum. And they can calculate time. How many years has that granite surface been exposed to cosmic ray inundation. I know this sounds like science fiction now. It is to me. But they're getting dates now. They're getting dates from erratics above Wenatchee, erratics that are up by Grand Coulee Dam, erratics in Drumheller Channels, erratics down and perched around the lower Yakima. And they're getting dates that kind of make sense. <laughs> How many years has that boulder been sitting there since the iceberg came in? You know, the, have you finished that thought mentally, by the way? The iceberg comes in, it's got all these rocks in it. It's a block that's, what did I say, 20 times bigger than this. It's sitting here, and what's the last part of the story? The iceberg melts, like the, the flood goes away. The iceberg's still hanging out here. And then how long does it take to melt an iceberg? I don't know, maybe just one summer? I have no idea. But those rocks then fall out of this iceberg in place. The iceberg clearly is not here anymore, but the rocks that were within the iceberg are. And that's the beginning of the clock for this radioactive decay within quartzes that are exposed to cosmic ray inundation. So the dates are in the neighborhood of those boulders above Wenatchee 22,000 years ago. The boulders that are over here, Babcock Bench, 17,000 years ago. I'm kind of making up numbers now, but they're all... They're all less than 25,000 years ago, and they kind of work with our general understanding based on other kinds of Ice Age flood deposits. I got one more thing I want to do, and then we'll involve you all. You're a very attentive audience, and I appreciate it. Plus, the Vinmans is getting cold. I don't know what. The ants are happy. We're going to hand these out. We don't have Patrick to hand them out today. Somebody volunteer to pet. Sure. 
This is an ant proof area. Please come help yourself. We're about to do we're, we're about to do live Q&A, but I got one more thing. I mentioned Eric Lindstrom last time. Eric Lindstrom has been working on a Brett's biography and he is uh, emailing me little passages and other thoughts as he continues to kind of slowly work on this. Here's Eric Lindstrom last week by email. Again, Eric is helping me re realize that we're exactly 100 years after the first summer that Brett was out here with the students in, in, in August of 1922. This will be quick. In, in August of 1922, Brett was accompanied by a group of undergraduate students. On each discrete leg of their Scablands tour, he assigned a couple of students to the task of managing logistical details while he and the rest of the group hiked through a particular area of interest, including here. The logistical team would break camp, transport gear to the next key destination, and then set up camp again and get the dinner going for that day. Those are maybe a couple of the students. Typically, Brett's and the rest of the field team would arrive that evening, having trekked the distance on foot, or maybe parts of it by hitching a ride on a local train. That evening, all of them were expected to share their observations and notes before hitting the sack. The next morning, the process was repeated, presumably with a shift of personnel, so that the camp and gear minders could be rotated into the field for a day or two until their turn at logistics came around again. So this fellow Eric Lindstrom got into this enough where he took a trip specially to the University of Chicago into the archives of the University of Chicago where Brett taught his whole career and his original journal is still there. And so Eric was working with the original notes by Brett's. Not all of the summer's notes uh, survive, but that first month a field study in the channeled scablands, August of 1922, does exist and survive, and Eric has been working with that. Here's back to Eric. The point I'm trying to get to, Nick, by email, is that that field trip, and on so many of the rest field trips, unsung students made meaningful contributions to the advancement of Brett's work. It would be appropriate, even timely, to somehow acknowledge slash celebrate that contribution, because this centennial year of Brett's work is worth noting. I'm, in my own small way, I'm trying to do that. Uh, I'll finish it. Uh, just to let you know, Nick, that first week that they were out here by train from Chicago, they got off in Spokane, and their first area where Brett's and the boys began their work was over a six or seven day period where they worked south from Spokane, Liberty Lake to Tekoa, or Tekoa? near as I recall, and then on to points west, Rock Lake, Ewan, Lamont, and finally Sprague, where they jumped on a train and headed back to Spokane. A couple weeks later, they were here. Frenchman Cooley, Drumheller, etc. And that was the first of almost every summer in the 1920s, Bretts and his students coming to this area, making all these observations, building this case for Ice Age floods, including ice rafted erratics, and I think you know the main part of the story. Nobody believed Brett's in the geological community for most of his life. Finally, people came out here and saw this stuff for real post-World War II, and it was easy to follow the conclusions of J. Harlan Brett's. It's time for some live Q&A. Yeah. And we have something here, this telegram just coming in on the trail somebody might want it for the display uh mike uh, there's a check here from marta it was on the trail that's you mike come on over some sort of crazy transaction nice job thank you okay so let's do some if, if you had enough thank you for coming out but let's do some live q a with whoever grandpa carl has anyone researched the dirt around the rock to see if it was water filled by later floods or how much was blown in by dust and how far in the ground does that rock go? Thank you. Grandpa Carl asks, has anybody looked carefully at the sediment that is surrounding these big erratics or maybe underneath or both? Um, I assume that work has been done generally. 
I think it's safe to assume most of this is windblown loose. I can't say for sure. Um, there are fine-grained slack water sediments that are typically in low spots that have been mapped here. So just by the way, uh, Carlson's thesis, which some of you might want to read, he's got this whole area here mapped as a landslide, probably a landslide that is slightly pre-erratics. And that's Jack Paolo from the Washington DNR who mapped a lot of these areas, and I can't tell you what he used except maybe just the surficial expression here of this bench area where we don't have a bunch of exposed bedrock. But my point is that map in Carlson's thesis has rather specific mapping of fine grain slack water sediment, landslides, erratics, eddy bars, high density clusters, low density clusters, but the scale of that mapping is, is I'm sure, not to the level of uh, looking carefully at the sediment around each boulder. Next question. Yes. Yeah, is that the same Eric Lindstrom who taught invertebrate zoology at UPS? Are you the same Eric Lindstrom who taught invertebrate zoology at UPS? <laughs> You'll have to look at the comments down below the video, <laughs> sir, to get the answer. I'm not sure. I really can't remember how I connected with Eric, but probably. Yes. Yes. You mentioned uh, Bruce Bjornstead. Yes. Yes. Where a lot of icebergs seem to settle as uh, Lake Lewis is formed. Yes, sir. Question is, uh, is the Bruce Bjornstad that I mentioned the same person who did a very detailed study, Rattlesnake Mountain near Benton City, Washington? Same thing, same approach generally that, Car that Ryan Carlson did here. Very detailed mapping. You can imagine the hours on foot to locate every erratic, note the, the kind of rock. Note the elevation, iceberg rafting there as well. Same guy, yes. And if you're unaware, Bruce Bjornstead has two beautiful books on the trail of the Ice Age floods, book one and book two, uh, that are still uh, the best place to get detailed information involving Washington geology with many of these stories, especially if you're new to this concept of Ice Age floods. Let's keep it going. Yes. Can you say anything about the possible uh, benches or beaches for this area? Benches or beaches uh, during the Ice Age floods time? Yeah. Can I say anything about Ice Age benches or beaches? Um, kind of. Um, you may be, I'm, I'm, so there are things called strand lines where you have a lake, most famously at Glacial Lake Missoula, where you have a lake existing during the Ice Age time the lake is there because we're upstream of an ice dam. As far as I'm concerned, those strand lines still are a bit mysterious. But anyway, we have these markings on the side of a hillside that tell us of a high water mark of standing lake water. Some view them as beaches or berms during that lake time. There are no known strand lines here. And there are some faint strand lines just on the other side of Sentinel Gap. So if you're very interested in this strand line concept, uh, maybe the sun will be wrong by the time you go through today, I don't know. But if you go on the other side of Sentinel Gap and then you look back <laughs> to the northeast on the hillside, you can see some faint strand lines and those are attributed to Lake Lewis. But the, the, the strand lines uh, marking the high water mark of Lake Lewis, let's say 1250, are faint or non-existent, and our interpretation is Lake Lewis didn't exist for very long. So my working kind of teachable way of doing this is, okay, we got a big flood coming through here, that's fine, but we're talking about a few days, and we got Lake Lewis hanging out on the other side of Sentinel Gap for a few days. And there's an open drain at Willula Gap. In other words, our bathtub doesn't have a, a stopper in it. It's an open drain. So we're eventually going to drain that lake within a few days, maybe a week at the most. And that's not enough time to form a beautiful set of beaches or strand lines or benches, as opposed to Glacial Lake Missoula, where we had an ice dam, but we didn't have an open drain. We had, a, we had a, an ice cork in the tub itself. I assume that's what you were asking about. Thank you. 
A few more? Yes. Go down to uh, Mattawa and Desert Air. The soil is virtually non-existent. It's just sand. You know, big boulders like that mixed in. Now, was that drafted in or did that just get washed in and left it? Thank you. The question involves Mattawa, so now we are just downstream of Sentinel Gap. And the comment is there's essentially no soil right there in Mattawa, right next to the Columbia. And uh, next to the Columbia itself, there's an amazing stretch of just, there has to be thousands of basalt rocks just everywhere. I think that's kind of what you're describing. Some of them are granite. There's a beautiful metamorphic erratic right there south of Sentinel Gap, one of my favorites, surrounded by almost all basalt. But I take your word for it that there's some granites as well. So the question, I guess, is why don't we have good soils right there? And I think my simple answer is that's high velocity Ice Age flood. It's not quiet enough to get these soils to develop or to settle out. And that gets us to the Palouse and all these rich agricultural areas which by and large are out of the flood path. That's, that's not an Ice Age flood story where you have the rolling wheat fields. You're typically out of the pathway. So too much energy, too catastrophic in there. And even though it's been more than 10,000 years since the last Ice Age flood, uh, not enough time or something else to create those soils there. Yes? On, on the Waterville Plain. Yeah. Right. Are there are any of those erratics? True erratics, glacial erratics. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the question is about Waterville Plateau. Some of you have been up there. It's one of the most unique places in all of Washington, as far as I'm concerned. So if you go to Dry Falls, we're in an Ice Age floods channel. That's the Grand Coulee. But if you get up onto Highway 2 heading to the town of Waterville, and then you get on a couple of those north-south roads heading up towards Bridgeport, it's flat, it's dry land wheat, and there are big boulders out there in the middle of those fields, so big that they've, they've grown around, they've, the ag is around them. They're not bothering to move those haystack boulders. Those are glacial erratics. The ice sheet itself was there, so thank you for that. That's a common, I could do better with that probably. Um, we're not talking about ice here ever, right? That's been our discussion the whole morning. We have erratic, but the ice was never here. The icebergs were flooded in here by water, but the ice sheet itself was never here. But now what I'm saying is, if you can picture Highway 2 behind you, Highway 2, Everett, uh, Wenatchee, Waterville, Cooley City, Spokane eventually, the ice sheet got from Canada down to I, got, got down to US 2. Basically never crossed US 2. We're talking about the continental ice sheet from Canada, north of, inter, north of US 2 under ice, generally. South of US 2 in eastern Washington, no evidence of the ice sheet ever. So yes, those erratics are bigger, mostly basaltic, but the big message is those were gently dropped by the ice itself. And there's glacial till that those boulders are sitting in. There's no glacial till here. Yeah. A couple more? Yes. So what I observed here in this about 10 meter area, yeah. it's not just this large piece of granite, but yes. these other smaller pieces. So yes. I assume an iceberg doesn't contain just one rock. Right. Would it be fair to say that this cluster may have all been enclosed in an iceberg, and this is where the whole thing melted, dropping out all these right here? You, you, they're not over there. They're just right here. You've got it. You've got it. This is a berg mound, and the interpretation of a berg mound is we have a cluster of erratics, and it's not an accident they're clustered. The big and small granites were all in one iceberg, 20 times the size of this, the iceberg isn't here anymore, and we've come to visit 16,000 years later. Yes? Is it, from Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to end with this comment. 
Joel from Renton says, and could the granite be from Mexico? Now that's a thought. Hang on for a second. That was going to be part two of my question as I live in Leavenworth. The answer is yes. Whatever the question is. So the question is, I've never had that thought. Hang on for a second. So this is the last thing we're doing. I'm going to sign off with you and then I'm going to visit with these guys. This coming winter, we're going to talk about Baja BC. I promise I'm not going to go on for another 20 minutes here. But we're going to see pretty carefully that some of the granites in Washington that are older than 60 million years, that's already kind of too general, but of a certain age, older than 60 million years, some of them have paleomagnetic signature that they were moved from far, much further south, originally in Baja, Mexico. Now I'm hesitating because I'm thinking of the granites that are candidates, the bedrock granites that are candidates for this thing, and it's pretty unlikely to have a granite washed out of the North Cascades where many of these Baja BC granites are, for instance. Uh, let me say it this way. Thank you, this, uh, this is a new thought. So where's the nearest granite to here? It's freaking Mount Stewart right over there. Like we could get up on a couple of these ridges and see Mount Stewart from here, roughly. So why can't this be granite from Mount Stewart? Well, the answer is the Ice Age floods, regardless of what pathway we just talked about, there's no Ice Age floods coming from the Mount Stewart area and crossing the divide because you know why? The, the topography generally, when this Ice Age floods thing was happening, is generally the topography we have today. That ridge was there during this Ice Age flood story. The ridge between us and Mount Stewart was there. And so we just can't take any place that has granite nearby and think it's a possibility. So to finish my thought, thank you, this is really fun for me, at least. It seems unlikely we're going to take a granite from the Metau that's older than 60 million years, wash it down into the Columbia Valley somehow, then an Ice Age flood from Montana, picking it up somehow and, and getting it, yeah. But it's, it's interesting to, I've never had that thought. And we're going to stop with that one. So one last uh, look at these guys and they can wave goodbye to you and thank you all for watching this after the fact may the oh my, oh swear wars fans may the fourth be with you very good and uh, i do appreciate you all tuning into this and uh, we will continue with these pop-up events uh, sporadically i'm not sure when the next one will be that's about an hour or so of that that's about it thank you i love you and goodbye from the erratic Advantage Washington. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.